In this video, we begin by studying friction. Friction is an extremely complicated and important field of engineering and physics. There is no comprehensive solution or theory to the ideas of friction. There is rolling friction, there is sliding friction. Like I said, it is an extremely complicated thing that people spend billions of dollars studying. It's extremely important for bearing companies, for tire companies. People have PhD studies on it, but there is no general solution to the study of friction, at least not yet. Consequently, we will limit ourselves to the study in this class of sliding friction, which is a very small subset, but for which there is simple classical solutions to those problems. Now, some things about friction that people need to get out of their mind. Often people will say things like, well, you know, friction always makes things slow down. That's not true. Friction does not always make things slow down. For instance, without friction, cars can't move. If you don't believe this, just put the car up on uh, ice and see how fast it moves. So it isn't true. Friction's always a bad thing. Well, friction's what enables jacks to work to jack up cars. So friction can be a very good thing. In fact, the human knee is an amazing thing in the fact that based upon whether you put pressure or not, it can either raise or lower the coefficient of friction, which enables you to walk easily with low friction, but when you decide to stand and want to stand rigid, it allows the friction coefficient to go up, thereby making it so that you're steady. If you ever see a small colt uh, or other young animal that's born when it's first born, its legs are wobbly, and that's because the coefficient of friction hasn't yet absorbed, been risen by the absorbing of the oil that exists inside the knee. If you ever injure your knee, as I have, uh, then you'll find out, as athletes do, that what a wonderful thing the knee is and how bad it is when you hurt it. So we're going to study only sliding friction in this case and what's called static sliding friction. Well, static friction, the knowledge of it goes way back to Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was most famous, as I mentioned probably earlier, in projectiles for his military stuff. And people fought wars in Italy over it. And one of the things Leonardo needed to do was pull cannons. So he was concerned about how many horses were required to pull a cannon. In those days, you didn't really want to put cannons necessarily with with wheels because when the cannon shoots, we'll find out it recoils and would roll back. So you might want to make it have a flat bottom, but if you had a flat bottom, doesn't matter how big the bottom is, doesn't matter what type the bottom is, doesn't matter, you know, how heavy the cannon is, all of these type of questions Leonardo need to answer. So he needed to understand friction. The fact that friction was not understood, going back to the Greeks, is one of the reasons that Aristotle got the laws of physics wrong. I mean, it wasn't that they didn't look, but they thought that something required things to move because they didn't realize that friction was causing things to stop. So, Leonardo da Vinci develops the first, and what we will study in this class, theory of sliding and static friction, and is still used today. So, in this picture here, I have a block here of some mass M, and I've attached a spring mass here, and I'm pulling, and you can do this in your classroom, and when you pull, you'll find that, you know, there's a reading on it. Let's say this reading right here looks to be about 3.5, say, newtons. And even though you're pulling it one way, this block is not moving. And more important than just not moving, even if it was moving at constant speed, it's not accelerating. That's what we mean by static. Not accelerating. So A sub X is zero meters per second squared. And we're, of course, going to draw our X and Y axis like this. So this is some table. This is some block. This is a spring. I'm pulling on the spring, but even though I'm applying a force to block, the block is not moving, and it stays that way. And so this is the case of static. So I'm going to draw a free body diagram of this object, at least of the forces that I know so far. Of course, Leonardo did not know about free body diagrams. Galileo came and used Leonardo's work. But there's my block. And... I've got a normal force up. I have a weight force down. I know that there's a spring force here. Those are forces that I know about or can see. I'm going to stop at this moment 
and just apply Newton's laws and see what comes out of it, it turns out I'll find that this free by diagram is insufficient. I'll have to come back and modify it. So let's see here. The sum of the forces in X is M A sub X. The sum of the forces in Y is M A Y. But we know some things. We know it's not accelerating. So if I go over here and I write, I have F sub S, and that's zero, but it's not zero, it's 3.5. And over here I have N minus W is zero, and that would say that my normal force is equal to my weight, which is just MG. Now this equation looks okay, but this equation has a problem because I just said a minute ago with the spring scale I can read FS and it's 3.5 and yet Newton's law says it has to be zero. Well it can't be zero so that means I'm missing an arrow somewhere and I know that that arrow has to be a force pulling this away and I'll denote it by a little f, the friction force. So it has to be minus f and then it can equal zero. So the first thing I see is that I can tell you how big the friction force is because I go back up here for a minute and remind you that my spring scale says that there's a force pulling 3.5 newtons this way. Therefore, the friction force must be applied 3.5 newtons in the opposite direction. Furthermore, I know the reason that the friction force, if it wasn't touching this ground, then there wouldn't be any friction. So the friction is an interaction between this ground, this table, and this block. So that's where it has to be applied, and it has to be applied in the opposite direction of the other forces. Now, I didn't say it had to go this way every time. If somebody was pulling this away at six newtons, and this was three and a half, then the sum of those would be two and a half in this direction. That friction force would go over here. So the only way to find this friction force is to actually do what I just did, to solve Newton's laws. And sometimes it is not obvious the direction of the friction force. For instance, if you have an, a block on an inclined plane and a force is trying to pull the block up, but gravity is trying to pull the block down, you have to first just assume there's no friction, figure out which way the net forces go, and then from that figure out what's got to be added to make the sum equal zero, just like I just got through doing. So this wasn't just a, an unnecessary, you know, uh, exercise. It actually shows you what you have to do in more complicated problems. You don't know the direction that the block would want to move, then you've got to actually figure it out by working Newton's second law. Something else it says is that this friction force, it can change its value. Right now, it needed to be 3.5 newtons to offset this friction, uh, this spring force. But if I'd only been pulling with two newtons, then the friction force would have decreased as well. If it didn't, then the block would have taken off because acceleration here would not have been zero. So this is a couple of the things that actually make static friction problems harder than moving or kinetic friction. And I put this in your notes as well in just a second, but I want to at least mention them now. Uh, let me go ahead and graph what I just got through saying. What I just said was this friction, uh, let's just remove this little f here, and we'll put that s there. Then this thing should be a straight line of slope equal 1 because we had f equal f s. And this will be true to some point. But at some point, if you pull hard enough, then this block will begin to move. So there is some max friction force. And it's directly equal to this F S. And at that point, that will have the same thing as what the friction force is. So there is some maximum friction. You can pull until you reach that, but if you pull more than that, then this object's going to begin to move. 
and accelerate because the friction can only hold it so much. So until that point, the friction force could be any value along in here. If it's this big, then it's because it's here. If you pull with this much, then it'll come over and it'll be this now. If you pull more, it'll come up and it'll be over here. So it will adjust itself to match how hard you are pulling on it. So let's look at a microscopic picture, try to understand what's really going on here. What's really going on here at a microscopic level is that although we may think of these as smooth, they are not smooth. And today we have electron microscopes. And they look like this. And if you attempt to pull this block this way, then this bump is going to move over and smack into that bump there. And this ridge is going to smack into that bump there. So based on how those ridges, those bumps are, what you're really doing is having a bunch of normal forces. So this normal force would point something like that. And when you bump into this one here, maybe it points like that. Always pointing perpendicular. This one maybe it points like this. So these little vectors get added up and they give you some average normal force. Now, the normal force can then be broken into two parts. That part which we normally call the normal force perpendicular to the surface and this part which is the friction. So they are actually connected by this bumping in here. And by the way, if you attempt to go the other direction and move it this way, let's say you tried to move it this direction, then now this piece is going to bump and you're going to get a force this away. This piece is going to bump into the green and get a force that away. And notice that now these arrows are going to sum up so that they still have an upward part, but this horizontal part, the friction force, is going to change directions. It's going to oppose the direction of motion. Now let's put those guys into your notes here. The first is there is no general formula for the magnitude of the static friction force. Its value is whatever is required to prevent acceleration and must be found by, well, tell you what, instead of acceleration, must be to prevent motion, so you can be more general, and must be found by applying Newton 2. So, no general formula, only Newton's second law. The direction of the static friction force is such that it's whatever direction opposes motion. In the next video we'll talk about another very special case of the static friction. That is the point of the maximum static friction. The point right here. For the general rule there's no way to know what that force is. You just have to solve Newton's second law and make sure its direction opposes motion. But at this point right here when it reaches its maximum there is a formula that you can use in problems and in the book. And we'll pick that up on the next lesson.